Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webcast. I hope your week is being good to you so far. I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing at Golden Helix, and today, Jamie Bartle, our Senior Field Application Scientist, is going to walk us through some custom family workflows in Barseek. Jamie, take it away. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, as Cheryl said, my name is Jamie and I'm a field application scientist here at Golden Helix and I'm happy to talk to you today about some custom family workflows. Within Varseek, we ship some default workflows for trios and we've had a lot of support type questions that are involved with adding additional samples to the workflow and so that's what we're going to go ahead and talk about today. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, feel free to type them into the GoToWebinar um, window under the questions pane. You can type them in at any time, and we will try to get to as many of them at the end of the presentation as we can. For our agenda today, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just doing a quick overview of Golden Helix, just to introduce you to, for those of you who are new, uh, to our software and our company, I'll give you a brief introduction to us, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Varseek, which is what we're going to be using for our presentation today. And then we, once we jump into Varseek, um, we're going to be looking at a quad workflow, so a mother, a father, and two affected children, and then we're going to be looking at a trio um, with an additional unaffected sibling, and then we're just going to be throwing the parents away and looking at two affected siblings in our last workflow. <coughs> So, just as a brief introduction to Golden Helix and who we are, um, Golden Helix was founded in 1998. Our founder spun off early work from GlaxoSmithKline, and GSK is still, to this day, a key investor in the company. Golden Helix started out creating products for genomics and bioinformatics with our Helix Tree software, um, which has since become our SNP and Variation Suite. We have since added two products, Genome Browse and Varseek, which is what we're going to be talking about today. With, this, with these products, the company has over 17 years of experience in bioinformatics and has been cited in over a thousand peer-reviewed publications. We have a few of the publications uh, listed here on Nature, Nature Genetics, and some other common and not so common publications as well. Golden Helix serves over 350 organizations worldwide, including the top tier research organizations, for example, like Stanford and Sick Kids Hospital up in Toronto, clinical labs like the Mayo Clinic, as well as major government institutions like the National Cancer Institute and the FDA, and some pharmaceutical companies as well. Teva and Bayer are a couple of examples. All of these customers leads to thousands of users who trust our software in their labs and with their research. We are very proud of the fact that when you buy a product from Golden Helix, not only are you getting a piece of software, you're also getting our reputation for quality products, excellent customer service, and domain expertise. We also have the experience of developing software for over 17 years. Um, we have a wide range of experts on our staff, including biostatisticians, mathematicians, and software engineers. We earn the trust of our customers by reaching out and understanding our customers and their needs. We take the time to research relevant topics and publish blogs and ebooks on subjects to gain knowledge and pass on what we have learned to the community. Um, currently on our website, we have about six different um, ebooks available, including our genetic testing for cancer, which is a recent one that we've updated. These are free to download, so feel free to go to our website to download a copy. Our team of experts are available to provide the resources needed to help complete your analysis from training to technical support. We try to support our customers every step of the way, including documenting all of the major methods and algorithms that are used, including formulas, some examples, as well as article citations for each of the methods that we use. As I mentioned today, we are going to be looking at our Varseek software. And so just to kind of give you a brief introduction to the entire Varseek stack of technology, it's separated into about four different um, functionality groups. Um, the main group is Varseek itself, which is the desktop application that we use. This is where the majority of the work happens. So here is where we're going to be importing our VCF files, we're going to be performing our annotations, both variant and gene level annotations. We're going to be running various algorithms, for example, um, looking for compound heterozygous workflows, that's an algorithm within our software. And we're going to be using Varseek to create filter chains to filter our variants down to a set of candidate variants or variants we may want to pass along for further analysis to other individuals. 
Once you have identified your variants of interest, then our reporting functionality can come into play with VS Reports. With this functionality, what you would do is you would go ahead and flag those variants of interest, and then those variants would be included in customized reports. These reports are available in a variety of formats. Um, the templates we currently have available produce reports in HTML format that can easily be saved out in PDF. And we will be looking at an example of one of these reports today in this webcast. Once you have used Varseek and the reporting functionality to decide your workflow, so decide on the, the annotation sources that you're going to be using and the filtering that you're going to be doing, then our pipeline, our command line functionality, VS Pipeline, can take that workflow that you've developed and automate it. So it can run samples automatically through that workflow and produce automated deliverables. So it's designed for high throughput analysis. Also, once you have created your projects within the desktop application of Varseek, and either through the standalone manually creating those projects or using the automated pipeline, then our warehouse functionality can come into play. Our warehouse is designed to organize samples into these projects up on the warehouse, and so that we can create variant frequency annotations for those projects. We can also centrally host um, any reports that have been completed. So you can ask yourself a variety of things with the warehouse. See, um, questions like, have I seen a particular variant before? And if so, at what frequency? Um, as well as, has, have I reported this variant in a particular clinical report? And what was the determination at that time? The warehouse has extremely scalable technology and multiple interfaces. For the webcast today, we are going to be focusing on the desktop application part of it. Um, with the addition of a little bit of reporting functionality. The sample data that we're going to be looking at is our custom family that we have created. This family was simulated using a thousand genomes uh, Vietnamese related samples. Um, we pulled the particular trio that's available, the father and the mother and the affected child is our trio workflow, and then we grabbed two other um, related samples. They are a sibling pair that was available. When we formed our family, we formed it so that two of the affected daughter, or two of the, the daughters are the, the two affected samples, and then we have an unaffected son. We, for this particular family, we downloaded the BAM files from 1,000 genomes, and we used GATK to do the variant calling. So as I mentioned, the two daughters, um, the way we formed it, they are affected. And so, of course, we have a phenotype for their particular affection status. So our phenotype are our disease of interest that we're, that we're going to be looking at for this particular set of samples um, is hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, um, going to be known for, from now on as HED. Um, HED is a rare genetic condition that's characterized um, by the reduced ability to sweat, also missing teeth and fine sparse hair. Um, this particular disease can be inherited in one of three patterns. Um, the most common, 95% of the reported cases, is an X-linked recessive inheritance pattern. And then the least common are either autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant, um, at only 5% of the samples being identified with that particular inheritance pattern. For the workflow today, since we do have um, affected uh, daughters as opposed to sons, we are going to be focusing more along the lines of the autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant models that are available for this particular disease. With this disease, um, literature has identified four genes um, that are most commonly associated with this particular disease. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at um, full rank, um, which is our gene ranking algorithm, so that we can go ahead and prioritize the genes that are present in the data so that we can select some, um, hopefully some variants of interest to this particular gene. So let's go ahead and we um, begin looking at Varseek itself and jump into our quad workflow. For our quad workflow, once again, we have a mother, father, and two affected siblings. We're going to be looking at a couple of different things from this particular workflow. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up our shipped trio template, and we're going to look at um, determining a set of de novo candidates that are um, for each one of the siblings combined. And so we want to look at that entire set and we want to take a look and see how we easily can do that within the software. 
once we've looked at that ship template, we're actually going to jump over to a project that has a more customized template that's designed to find things that are in common between the two affected daughters. Both de novo and compound heterozygous candidates is what we're going to be looking at. And then once again, we're going to use full rank to prioritize some of our variants before adding them to a clinical report. So we're going to go ahead and jump into VARSEQ. And once again, the first thing that we're going to look at is a project that, once again, already has the data loaded into it. So I've got the mother and the father, and then I've got those two affected probands. Our shipped template, which for those of you who are familiar with the software, has six different inheritance patterns that it is looking for in any particular workflow. These workflows are specific to the current sample that you're looking at. So in this case, the current sample that we're looking at is the 2024 affected daughter. If I move to the second one, the 2046 daughter, then those values are going to change accordingly to that particular sample. And so if we want to determine, without too much work, um, the de novo candidates that are in either of the daughters, so we've got 114 that are in the first sample, and we've got 926 that are in the second sample, but they may be some of them in common, and so if we want to form that full list, we have a fairly easy way to do it. First thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm just going to collapse some of these that we're not really going to look at in this data set, just to get them out of the way. And to form our entire set, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using our variant set functionality. So from the toolbar right here, I'm going to create a new variant set. And I'm going to go ahead and just leave the default settings. I'm going to change it to blue because I like blue a little bit better than red. And the key to using this functionality is I'm going to be dealing with both of my samples together. So I'm going to go ahead and uncheck this. If I leave it checked, then um, my flags will only be um, the same for each sample individually. So I want to look at them all together. So I'm going to go ahead and create that variant set. And once again, I want to look at the combined set, so I'm going to click this 114 that are coming out of my de novo candidate workflow. So I have 114 in my variant set here, and I'm going to go ahead and automatically flag all of these variants. The way that we do that, once again, is through the variant set functionality. I'm just going to add the current variants to this particular set. The next option, or the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to my second sample so that out of my de novo candidate workflow, I'm seeing those 926 variants that are common to my second sample. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing again. I'm going to go ahead and go into my variant sets, and I'm going to add these to the current variant set. Now if I go back to the original amount of data that I imported, which was a little over 400,000 variants, I can click on this column header to get a description of actually how many variants I have flagged. So the combined variants or the combined de novos for these two samples, there is 1,025 of them. Now we can easily filter down to these just by creating a filter card on this particular column. If I right click here and create a filter card on this column, it's going to add a brand new filter to my chain up here, and if I want to select only those that are true for this, that means that it's a de novo candidate um, in either of my samples, I can go ahead and select that and update my table to those particular variants. And once again, this filter is no longer sample specific, so as I move to the next filter or the next sample in the list, these values will stay the same because it is in common with both of them. Once I have that list, there's a variety of things that we can do with it. We could probably do some prioritization of the variants, but another option that we can do is we can actually create or export a multi-sample VCF file um, from these particular variants. The way that I do that is very easily from the export menu, I'm going to select VCF file, I'm going to ex export this variant table that we're currently looking at, and going ahead and hitting OK. Now this dialog is a little bit busy, but the key of course to our VCF export is that it's designed to export anything that we currently imported from the VCF file, but I can select some extra information. Now because the, the variants that we're selecting aren't sample specific and all of my samples were present in the table, I'm just going to leave it at the current sample options and then all I would have to do is hit export and it would go ahead and create that VCF file for us that we could go ahead and take a look at it in a text editor if we wanted, but the key to it is, you know, it's going to contain all of our samples and all of those 1,025 variants that we're looking at. If we wanted to take a look at it, um, say in a text editor, 
and we'll pop that over to this particular window here. You can see that all four of my samples are included in there with all of the information that was provided in the VCF file for those samples. And so this right here is an easy way of creating a multi-sample VCF file so that maybe you could share that with a colleague or maybe you could import just those variants into a separate project to deal with your workflow in that format. Now in general, um, with a workflow, instead of looking at, you know, variants that are present in either of your samples, what you want to do when you have two affected is you want to look at the variants that are in common between the two, the two samples that you're dealing with. Okay. So we have, I have a separate project set up for that. And the filter chain, I've just narrowed it down to one set filter chain and I've got it arranged in just a little bit different manner. The way that it's currently set up though, we're still looking at those 114 de novos in that 2024 sample. And if I moved over to the 2046 sample, there's that 926 that we briefly looked at before. What's happening with these filters is the quality assurance or the quality filters for these samples is the same. And so what I did was I just created a container that just had those quality filters in them. And then I split out the de novo and the compound hets into their own containers. So let's go ahead and talk about how we can um, adjust this particular filter chain so that we can look for variants in, in the de novo case and in the compound heterozygous case that are in common between our two variant or samples. So the first thing, um, once the quality filters, the only two filters that are really sample specific are our read depth filter and our genotype qualities filter. This filter right here is um, looking for rare variants based off of annotations with NHLBI. And this is limiting the number of variants down to loss of function or missense. sense. So both of these are going to be the same uh, regardless of the sample that we're looking at. So we only have to deal with changing these. The easiest way to change these, um, starting with the read depth filter, I'm going to go ahead and hit this wrench icon right here. And instead of picking the current sample, I want to set this to be to a very specific sample. So I'm going to set it to the first proband. And then I also want to incorporate the read depths or the quality information for that second proband as well in my data set. So I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to duplicate it. And then I'm going to go ahead and switch over my sample that I'm looking at to that second sample. And so now for our read depths anyway, we're looking at keeping only those variants that have greater than 10 for a read depth for both of our samples. So starting from that total of 400,000 variants, we're down to about 50,000 of interest. Do the same thing for genotype quality so that we can also account for that. We go ahead and change it to be sample specific, quickly duplicate that card, and choose our second sample. And now our quality assurance um, is done and it accounts for every single one of our samples. So we've got about 1,278 variants that pass our quality assurance methods. And as I switch between samples up here, that value stays the same because these are not sample specific. So our um, quality filters are done, so I'm going to go ahead and just collapse that up there so that's out of the way. And now we're going to go ahead and look at our de novo and our compound het. Now, one of the things that you may be seeing here with the compound het is this little information icon. Updates or the way that compound het functionality works within the data set, um, it is designed to only look at variants that are passed into this particular filter chain. So it's run based on whatever number of variants are present in the card right above it. And so if this value changes for any of the choices that you made, you do have to quickly rerun this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, click on that information icon so that we can quickly update our compound heterozygous count so that's accurate for our data set. And now similar to our read depths and our genotype qualities, Currently, these filters are set to only look at a single sample, and it's looking at the single sample um, that's currently visible in the table up here. So just like with our read depth filter, what we want to do for this particular workflow to account for that secondary proband, and we want to find, in this case, de novo candidate variants that are in common between the two of them, I'm going to go ahead and once again make this sample specific. And then I'm going to go ahead and um, duplicate that and set my second sample. And now, 
for this particular filter chain, my de novo workflow, these 15 variants that have been identified in my data set are de novo candidates in both of my samples. And so to kind of get an idea of what that looks like, in my genome browse tab up here in the corner, what I've loaded into it is the VCF files from my data set. And the VCF files um, from the mother, the father, and then the two affected children are what I've gone ahead and loaded in the data set. And as I scroll through my list down here, what you can see is what is present in each one of my samples. And so for the 15 de novos that I'm looking at, we want that alternate allele to be present in our two samples, but we don't want the an appearance of that alternate allele in the mother or the father. So this is an example of a de novo that's in common between the two of them, whereas this one, because that it's present in the father, this would not be considered a de novo. So this one is part of our list and this one isn't. Similarly, we want to do the exact same thing for our compound HET filter. Our compound HEP filter, we're going to go ahead and switch that over to be sample specific, and we're going to go ahead and duplicate it really quickly and change the sample visibility on that. And so just like before, um, now we're going to be looking at uh, variants that make up compound HET regions for both of our samples. We have 17 of them of interest, and let's go ahead and see if we can find a good picture of what one looks like within the data set. So in the case of our um, compound HET workflows for any particular gene region, and we can look at this in terms of a, a gene level annotation as well. If I switch over to my gene view, then what we have is the list of genes that were identified in this workflow and the variants that are present in them. So if I select any one of these particular genes, you can see the two uh, variants that make up that compound heterozygous variant. There could be more present in the data set, but the key is that um, one of them is going to be inherited from the mother, one of them is going to be inherited from the father, and it should be true for both of your samples. I'm going to go ahead and just turn on both of my samples. Right now I just have the current ones visible. But what you'll see is we've got a het um, in the father, we've got a het in the mother at this location, and it's being inherited by both of the probands. And so we've got our, our inheritance pattern uh, working correctly for our data set. As I said before, you know, we had a very particular phenotype of interest that we were looking at for this particular workflow. So if I wanted to prioritize to flag several of these variants to be included in a clinical report, the way that I could do that is through our full rank algorithm. And just to kind of give you an idea of how full rank is run, all of our algorithms are under the add um, computed data options. And because I have two affected samples, but they have the exact same phenotype of interest, what I've gone ahead and done is I have ran an overall project level for rank. This is a tool that's um, not quite available yet in the shipped version of RSeq, but it will be coming very soon. What this asks for, or what this does, is it's going to prioritize our variants based on the genes that they're present in and how closely related they are to the phenotype that we've entered. So the first thing it's going to ask you is um, where can it find that list of gene names? And you go ahead and hit OK. Generally the default options are correct. And this right here is our phenotype of interest. If I want to go ahead and just give it an overall name so I know how that one is identified, and then I can just go ahead and hit OK to run it. Keeping in mind that anytime we annotate or anytime an algorithm is run in the software, or just about any time, you know, we're going to be annotating all of the data that's present. So sometimes, um, depending on the tool, it may take a couple of minutes to finish. We do have a little over 400,000 variants in our data set. But when that finish is running, what you're going to get is you're going to get some um, gene scores. And these gene scores, the higher the gene score, the more closely related that gene is to our phenotype of interest. And then overall, those particular scores are going to be ranked for your entire data set. Right now, we're only currently looking at the genes that are present in the 17 compound heterozygous variants. Um, we can look at those scores overall for the whole um, 400,000 variants. If I just click on that 400,000, that's going to show me all of the possible scores and associated ranks, as well as the shortest path that is identified by full rank. Once again, we're just, we just really care about um, those 17 variants of interest, and what you can see is overall ranking-wise, if I go ahead and sort this um, in descending order, anything that's highly ranked is right there at the top, and this particular gene is one of those four genes that was listed 
um, on the documentation in the publications for this particular disease. And so we can see that this, that this uh, gene right here is very highly associated with our phenotype of interest. And we have two different variants that are present in that data set that um, show some of the inheritance patterns that are possible within this data set. So these are two very great variants. We want to go ahead and flag them so that we can add them to a clinical report. The way that we flag variants is once again using our variant set function. We just create a new variant set. This time I'm going to leave it as sample specific. <clears throat> and I'm just going to leave the default options that are available here. And I'm just going to go ahead and flag both of these variants to be included in our report. Now the reporting functionality that is available within the data set, um, within Varseq itself, once again, is just another view within the software. So if I hit any of these plus signs, I can go ahead and open up that reporting view. Now we've created a specialized template for our quad functionality. And so I've got some things that are already filled in and some things that are going to be auto filled in from some of the tables that we have. The report functionality is currently designed around TRIO workflows, so if you have additional siblings, um, you actually have to prompt for that particular information for those additional siblings. By default, it's going to pull in the information for the proband, uh, the mother and the father, including the sample 2024, but I actually had to enter in sample level information for that second 2046 sample. And so what we're looking at in this particular report functionality is we've got the information for the sibling. We've got some physician information as well as specific patient results for both of our samples. So this was the ID for the 2024 and this was the ID for the additional sample. And so we can set either positive or negative results and um, with particular comments involved for both of those samples. Just like any of our other reports, you know, we could enter in some interpretation summaries or some recommendations based on the variants that we found. For right now, I'm just going to go ahead and leave that one blank. The key to our reporting functionality, of course, is that you want to be able to select the variants to add them to the report. The easiest way to do that is, once again, just by flagging them within the table and adding them to the report. With the variants and this particular report, we're auto-filling some very specific information in. That information includes, um, of course, variant level information, chromosome position, ref alt, and the gene that the data is in. This is a user-selected classification. Um, this can be customized if you wanted to say, um, report what ClinVar says about a particular variant, that's something that could be updated. Um, but for right now, this is a user-selectable um, drop-down box. And then for each variant, what we have is some autofill coming in from the annotations that are in our table. So the first group of information is actually coming from our gene annotation. So this is a missense variant and the gene that it's located in. And then following that is the OMIM information that's present for this particular gene. Similarly with both samples. Once we have that done, um, we want to just go ahead and render our report by hitting the sync button up here. And I'll just extend that so we can take a look and see this particular family report. The way that this report is organized, um, there's a couple of things happening in here. We've got our lab information as well as our family ID. We have all of our patient information down the left-hand side of the column here, starting with the mother, father, and our two affected siblings. For those two variants that we've entered, they're listed up here with their C dot and P dot notation along with their pathogenicity. Those four genes that are of interest for this particular phenotype, I've gone ahead and added them and we've seen that we're, we're flagging variants in this particular gene. Now this report functionality has a special feature in that it actually allows you to enter in a pedigree chart of interest for your particular data set. So we can go ahead and do that before we move on to looking at further information. The way that we do that, I'm just going to go ahead and stash that out of the way right now. Um, is under the report feature, we're going to go ahead and select the option button and configure our report template. And here is where we could um, enter in an image for our lab information, which we already have, and then our pedigree information is allowed to be entered in this particular window. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, grab my pedigree, assuming that I can find my pedigree. There it is. And give it a nice little title. So this is my thousand genomes. KHV family, and I'm going to go ahead and hit OK, and then we just need to resync the project, and we'll pull that out of there and make it big again, 
and you can see that, that my pedigree has been added directly to my family chart. Following down here, if I scroll to the bottom, this is where we're going to see those variants that we've entered. So there's the summary information. And because it is a family workflow and we've got a couple of different annotations for the, the options that we've entered, um, we've got some compound head inheritance ha um, information that we're selecting as well as DBNSFP information and then so a variety of other sources that are available for our data. Once again, this is right now currently a draft report. Um, there is a sign off feature that I could go ahead and sign it off and that information would fill in. And so for all intents and purposes, we've flagged our variants. We've gone ahead and created our clinical report. Um, we've identified different variants of interest for a couple of different options. And so in theory, our quad report is complete or our quad workflow is complete. And so let's go ahead and um, move on to the next one. Jump back to PowerPoint here really quickly. And we're going to move on. Uh, so that was our quad workflow with uh, the associated clinical report. I'm going to go ahead and move on to our trio plus our unaffected sibling workflow. So for this particular workflow, we have a mother, father, we have one affected daughter, and then we have an unaffected son. We're going to be looking specifically at the custom template and we're going to be using it to set sample specific filters so that we can go ahead and um, exclude information that is present in that unaffected sun. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at is, is how inverting filter cards can work, and then we're going to be looking specifically at using the count allele algorithm as well in our data set. So just a little quick um, PowerPoint, and then we're going to go back to Varseq. So. Jumping back to Varsik, let's take a look at our um, trio plus our unaffected sibling workflow. And so our quality filters, once again, are pretty much the same. Now, because we are adding in an unaffected sibling, we may not care too much about read depth or genotype qualities of that unaffected sibling, but if we did care about it, we could go ahead and update these filters very similarly to how we updated them before by changing them to sample specific filters and then go a, going ahead and duplicating to add it for the second card. For this particular workflow, I'm going to go ahead and just leave the quality filters alone and just um, use them off of our affected proband, which is the current sample that we're looking at. So I'm going to go ahead and just collapse those out of the way. And now once again with our workflow that we're looking at here, um, with that unaffected symbol or with that unaffected sibling that's added, in general when looking for de novo candidates for a particular phenotype of interest or a, a particular affected child, any de novos that you find for that affected child, um, you want to guarantee that those de novos aren't also there for the for the unaffected as well. And so what we want to go ahead and do is we've set this um, to the very specific affected child. So we're looking for de novo candidates for the affected child. There's about 929 of them in this particular data set. What we want to do is we want to pull out anything that's also um, in the unaffected. So I'm going to go ahead and just duplicate this card. I'm going to switch it so that we're looking specifically at our unaffected child. And then last but not least, once again, we want to exclude these. So I'm just going to right click on this and I'm going to invert it. So we want to only pass through variants that are de novo for our affected, but we don't want them to also be de novo for our unaffected as well. And so we've got 572 uh, variants of interest that we can go ahead and look at. And as you can see in the table, um, just as the top couple, um, we do have um, heterozygous calls for our proband and then our child, our unaffected child is referenced at those locations. And so of course we can look at them in genome browse as well. As we click through the table, um, we want once again the only person to have that alternate allele present in the data to be that affected child. Everybody else we either want to be referenced or missing and that is true for all of these ones of interest. And now the compound HEP functionality that's available within the software, um, there is one restriction on this particular algorithm and that it currently only runs um, on affected children only. So I can't just duplicate this card because it won't make any sense in terms of my unaffected child. But what we can do is we can actually use our allele count algorithm. So once again, under our add computed data, I've ran the count alleles algorithm, which 
will provide me not only with allele counts, which is the account of each alternate allele in the data set, it's also going to provide me with the number of hets that are present at each location across all of my samples. And that right there is of particular interest to us in this case. So if I scroll over to that particular output in my data set, here's my allele counts. In particular, there's that number of hets column that I have that's of interest to me. What I want to go ahead and do is I want to create a filter card based on that value. So I'm just right clicking on it and creating that filter card. And now for the number of hets that we want to consider, when we're talking about a compound het situation, for each variant that's present in that compound het gene or de that determines that compound het gene, it has to come from or show inheritance from exactly one parent. And so for each variant that forms that compound het, there's actually two hets involved in creating that one from whichever parent is inheriting it, and then, of course, the affected child that's getting it. We don't want to also see a het in the unaffected child, and we don't want both parents to be hets. So for this particular workflow, we're just going to limit this to two, specifically that it's equal to two. And now, where I actually want to add this particular card, I'm going to move it from its location, um, I actually want to add this card above my compound het calculation from before so that I can restrict any compound hets that are determined in the affected child based on the presence of or the absence of those het unaffected. So once again, because I've changed my output, or excuse me, my input, I'm gonna go ahead and have to rerun that. It's a very quick algorithm, once again, because it's only running on those 638 variants. And there's nine variants of interest to us. If we want to go ahead and once again take a look at this in terms of the variants themselves, as I go ahead and click through the table right here, um, the variants that are going to be identified are going to be important to this particular workflow. And so if I look at it in a per gene situation, um, once again, what we have, uh, say in this last gene here on our list, is that we have an inheritance coming from the father and one coming from the mother. Actually, we have two coming from the mother, but that doesn't make any difference. But the proband um, is heterozygous, but our unaffected child is referenced at this particular location. So if I look at any one of these, we would expect to see exactly what we want. That we've got two hets present in the data set, and that's exactly what we want to see for that entire gene level. If I, if I double click on that gene, I can look at it on a whole gene view, but of course there's a lot more variants that don't necessarily make up that compound HET workflow. And so this is a way of accounting for some unaffected siblings in our data set. This would be very similar if you had several other unaffecteds as well. If you maybe you had two unaffected siblings and one, you would still want to restrict that number of HETs down to two. Okay. So that is uh, that particular workflow. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll um, talk a little bit about our last workflow that we're going to be looking at, which just deals with having two affected siblings in our data set. So we've got our two affected daughters. And so once again, we're going to be building a custom template to set sample specific filters. We're going to be using genotype zygosity for one filter, and we're going to be using the count alleles by gene algorithm to find shared compound hets. Once we have our list of candidate variants for each of these workflows, I'm going to take a look at a brand new annotation source that we're going to be soon including in Varseq, and that's going to be our CAD annotations, so that we can look at how we would prioritize the results of these particular analyses. Once again, back to Varseq, and we'll go ahead and take a look at our two affected siblings. With this particular workflow, um, right now I currently only have quality filters set up. Um, we do have two affected siblings or two affected um, samples in the data set. And so I've gone ahead and set read depth and genotype qualities for both of those affected samples. And so we've got 1,276 variants that pass all of our quality assurance for these samples. And now we want to look at building out um, our filter chain for both our read depth and our genotype qualities. And so Previously, I had a bunch of containers inside of containers, and I just wanted to go ahead and show you how to build those at least once. And so the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click in some empty space here, and I'm going to add a container. Now, this is going to be our overall container that's going to contain um, both our de novo workflow and our compound het workflow. 
And so within this workflow, what I want to go ahead and do is I'm going to actually create a container inside of my container. This particular one is going to be our de novo workflow only. And once again, I don't want to look at both compound hets and de novos at the same time. So I'm actually going to switch the way that this container is dealt with and treat it as an or situation so that we can can work with both of these separately and then I'm going to add my second filter container for my for my compound hat workflow and we'll just make these a little bit bigger so that we can start to actually add filter chains in them so here's the the, the main empty filter chain we don't have any current filter cards working in there but this was how it was originally created and so for our very first workflow, de novo candidates, um, in the case of, of most workflows, if you have the parents, you know, it's very clear whether those heterozygous variants were inherited um, because you would have the corresponding values that are present. But with just two unaffected samples, we don't have any parents present. So we can just come up with what we consider um, or de novo variants that are basically just both of the samples have heterozygous calls at the same location. And so we're going to use the zygosity um, algorithm that was run on this data. Once again, we could run it by going to add and selecting computed data and creating our filter cards. So just right clicking and creating our filter card. Once again, we're going to be looking for heterozygous variants in both of our samples. So similarly to any workflow before, I'm going to go ahead and set my sample specific filter and then I'm going to go ahead and just drag this into this workflow and make sure I select my heterozygous variants. Once that's done, all I need to do is duplicate it really quickly and change my sample specific filter. And now I have a set of variants, there's 499 of them, where both samples throughout my entire data set, um, both of those samples are heterozygous at both those locations. To do or build the exact same thing with our compound HET workflow, um, the very first thing that we need to do is we're going to have to actually run the count variance by gene algorithm. I haven't ran that one yet because it actually automatically creates a filter card for you. And so I want to go ahead and run that now. And this particular algorithm, once again, it's going to count the number of variants um, for each one of our samples in every gene. And so the first thing it's going to ask for is that list of genes that it's going to be looking in. And it's going to go ahead and run that analysis. Once again, it's a, it's a fairly quick analysis. Um, by default, uh, it actually creates a card that's based off of the number of variants um, field in that particular output. And what I'm actually looking for in this case is that I want to look for compound hets from my two samples. And so for this particular workflow, I want to guarantee that for each sample that there are at least two heterozygous calls in each one of my genes that we're looking at. So the first thing that I'm going to go ahead and do is make some changes to this particular workflow. I'm going to go ahead and first of all set it as sample specific. And I want to guarantee that there is at least um, two and once again we want two hets so I'm going to go ahead and update this to instead of look at an overall variant count to look at the specific het count as well. We go ahead and move that up into our filter chain right there and it didn't seem to like that one very much so let's go ahead and and reselect that sample and it automatically runs for us and once again we want to keep anything in this case that is either equal to or greater than two. This will guarantee that, that any gene region that we're looking at for what this particular sample has the possibility of creating a compound HET region because there are two HETs coming in from this particular sample. And then just like we did with our zygosity card, we're going to go ahead and um, duplicate this so that we can guarantee that the same thing is happening in our second sample. Selecting our sample there and finishing off with this particular workflow, we've got 380 variants where we have um, genes present that both of the samples has at least two variants in that particular gene. If we wanted to, we could go ahead and take a look at genome browse, we can look at the VCF files, we could even go so far as to look in the BAM files as well um, and go ahead and, and verify those. For this particular workflow though, as I mentioned um, in the slide that we were talking about, um, I have annotated this data source against our brand new CAD annotations and if I scroll to um, the very end of my document right here at the end, 
what you'll see is the output from that particular tool. And now I've, I've shown it to you um, right up against our other um, functional prediction uh, voting tool, which is our DBNSFP algorithm, just to show you the new features that are available in CAD are very nice in that with CAD, not only do you get scores for, of course, that are present in DBNSFP, you also get them for every other variant in your data set as well. And so CAD provides um, scores for all of the variants that are present in your data set. Some of them may be estimated if, if it's um, in particular an, an insertion or deletion that is not listed in their data set will actually use um, the surrounding information to estimate the information. In particular, what we care about in this data set is the FRED score. A FRED score value, if you click on that column header here, it'll give you a description of what's happening in that data as well as a nice little histogram of how it's organized throughout the data set. And as an example for good values to pick on here, if we're looking at the top 10th percent of CAD scores, um, we want to reduce our variance to the top 10 percent, then all we need to do is filter on this FRED score and set our threshold at 10. Anything above 10 um, is considered uh, damaging for our particular workflow. And so let's go ahead and we'll just create a filter card for this particular um, database. And we'll set that threshold of, of 10 in there and choosing to keep anything that's greater than 10. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to drop this in my de novo workflow so that we can get an idea of, of what that looks like. And so for our zygosity um, of those variants, those 499 that were hits in both of our samples, um, 273 of them have a CAD score that is greater than 10. I could also sort by this value, so if I sort it in descending order, you know, anything with the highest priority is going to jump to the top right there, or the highest um, damaging, and we can scroll over here to see what those variants are and where they happen to be present within our data set. And so this is just another way of prioritizing our information. If we also wanted to include that particular score in my compound hat workflow, I could go ahead and duplicate this card and then just drag it over to my other uh, workflow over here. And so then we've got 160 variants that form um, possible compound hat regions as well. So clicking on that, I can take a look at my per gene values. Um, and what you can see, is there are the genes that are present in those in those values as well. And so just another way of prioritizing variants, depending on any particular workflow that you're doing, um, you know, for example, um, you know, for this particular workflow, I have gone ahead and set specific filters based on the fact that, you know, there are just two affecteds, but maybe your workflow includes, you know, three affecteds, four affecteds. Um, what you can do in that case is, is you can do some more um, for example, instead of using zygosity in my de novo, I could actually look at the allele count algorithm and count the number of hets that are present. Um, with two samples, we want two hets present. With three samples, three, and so on and so forth within the data set. So there's a variety of ways to customize the workflows within VARSEQ so that um, it can handle uh, families, not just in trio format, but in, in multiple different formats that are in the data set. So let's go ahead and um, that pretty much finishes things up. Let's just uh, take a quick minute to, to go over all the work that we've done today. As you can see from this slide, we've done quite a bit. Um, as we're going through the summary, feel free to type in any questions that you may have in the, um, in the questions pane, and we'll try to get to as many of those as after this. But for our workflows, what we did for our quad workflow is, once again, we used the variant sent functionality to create a multi-sample VCF file, um, which includes the de novo candidates that were present in either of our affected samples. Then we used a sample-specific filter to create a custom chain so that we could look for things in common between our two affected symbol, um, samples. We used full rank to prioritize and created our customized report. Um, for our TRIO plus unaffected workflow, um, we use the ability to invert filter cards to exclude de novo candidates and the unaffected sample. And then we use the allele count algorithm to restrict the number of heterozygous calls for each position so that we could exclude any of the hets that were present in the unaffected sample. For our last workflow, we use genotype zygosity to identify possible de novo variants in common between our two samples, and we use the count alleles by gene algorithm to identify possible compound het genes. And then we looked at prioritizing our variants based on the new CAD annotation. So if you have any questions, um, now would be the time. I think Cheryl has a couple of announcements to make um, before we jump into actually talking about questions. 
Cheryl. Thank, thank you, Jamie. I do have a couple of quick announcements. Um, as always, webcast recording and slides will be up on our website just as soon as I can today or tomorrow, and I will either email them out to everyone as well, so keep an eye out for those. Um, our next webcast is coming up on June 8th, and that will be presented by Dr. Robert Hamilton of SickKids Hospital in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Hamilton was one of our winners, the second place winner, in our abstract challenge this year, and his presentation will surround <clears throat> whole exome sequencing in distant relationships to identify cardiomyopathy genes. Um, also, if you're heading to ESHG, don't forget we will be there. You can find Gabe Rudy in booth 378. And this Thursday, the 17th, I will post a most schedule on our blog. Um, so keep your eyes out for that as well. And that's it for me, so let's take a look at the questions. Doesn't the number HET equal to above the compound HET calculation force the unaffected sibling to have neither of the variants seen in the affected? That, that is true in that particular case. Um, what we're trying to do in, in that is we're trying to uh, limit the, the HETs that are shown are actually used to compute the compound HET um, down to a set of variants that are appropriate for just the affected sample, excluding anything in the unaffected sample. So it is true that, um, you know, the unaffected sibling would have neither of the variants seen in, in the affected, at least in a heterozygous state. Thank you, Jamie. That's actually all the questions I'm seeing right now. So um, if there aren't any more, we can go ahead and wrap. And if you do have questions or if you're interested um, in taking a look at Varseek, please get in touch with, in touch with us uh, via the details on the screen now. I hope everyone enjoys their day. Jamie, thank you so much for a great presentation. And we'll see everyone next time.